My name is Aiden Feldman, and you are here for Data Cleaning Techniques. My background is as a web developer. I've worked as a data engineer and a technology director in federal government for the past seven years and tech companies and startups and things before that. Uh, I also teach Python coding for public policy at the Wagner School at NYU. And although I've worked a lot with data, I would not consider myself a data scientist. I'm um, much more coming at this from uh, a developer mindset, but thinking about bringing best practices from the development world, applying them to data. The agenda for today is we're going to go over what data cleaning is generally. We're going to go hands-on with some tools, and then hopefully we're going to have time for Q&A. There is a lot of material uh, for today, so I'm going to be going pretty fast. Do not worry about retaining how to do a particular thing in a particular tool. That is not the point. I just want to show you what's possible. And then you can you know, look at the slides later, the materials later, and click through the links and learn more about the details of how to do it. Really trying to set the stage of what's possible, the different ways to go about things here. I am also going to sh try and show rather than tell, so get you uh, hands-on as soon as we can. But yeah. Today, we're going to be using NYC's 311 data set as an example, because it's one that I'm familiar with and one that we use for uh, that class at, uh, at NYU that I teach. But again, the techniques are really applicable anywhere. Where might your data live? You might have data that lives in spreadsheets. Basically, every organization and person does for data of some size. And even if that's, even if that's small, uh, that's still data. It could be more of a you know production system. You might have a centralized SQL database that you have different applications writing into or reading into and this kind of thing. But you could also be working with data from a third party, so consuming via an API, for example. These concepts are going to apply to all of these. The, the tools might differ a little bit, depending on what you're trying to connect to. Throughout the rest of the talk, I'm going to be using terms that refer to data in like a tabular format so think like a spreadsheet but really if you're dealing with json or any other format that would still uh, be applicable data cleansing is a process of removing or fixing incorrect malformed incomplete duplicate or corrupted data and there's a handful of things to check for you're going to look at this case at the different values and that can mean either a single cell or you could be looking across an entire row and that data could be missing or empty meaning things like null versus an empty string, are those the same thing, et cetera. There's bad or junk values. Some garbage got into got into one of the cells and shouldn't be there. Maybe that means that should be that single cell should be emptied, or maybe it means the entire row should, should be discarded. That's up to you. You might look for things like duplicates. Again, that could be across uh, a single cell, across multiple rows, or the entire row could be duplicated. You might have mismatched types or formatting, right? Something that should be a date column has text in it, and that's not something you want. There's, cate there's checks for categorical data. Categorical means uh, that it has a fixed set of values. And so there you might look at the different unique values. So maybe the data in this particular column should only be one of this given set. That also can correspond to the cardinality which is a statistics term for how much variance is there in the data. Like how much is the same versus different versus different. You're going to look at value counts. When you do have unique values, how much does each one appear? For continuous values, things that are usually like integers or a decimal, that kind of thing, you're going to look at the ranges. Maybe you're expecting the numbers to you know be greater than zero or between one and 10 or something like that. And then you also will look at the spread of the distribution, right? Should the data, all the values of these dates, for example, kind of line up evenly along this time scale, or do you expect some variance, that kind of thing? This isn't everything that you should check for, but it really is a lot of the cases where data cleaning becomes necessary. And these sort of checking for these things is really going to go a long way in terms of cleaning up whatever data set you're working with. But it's worth noting that there can be more complex constraints, uh, such as like dependencies than other data, if you're using foreign keys in a database, or things like aggregates of, I expect this many records per day, that kind of thing. All of these are the different considerations and you know things that you should look for when cleaning data, which try to come up with a helpful uh, mnemonic here of empty, bad, unique spread. Say it with me, empty, bad, unique spread. This is the most important thing in this talk. Right. It's minimal summary of this list. And when you're dealing with data for basically every column, look if there are empty values, look if there are bad values, 
look if there should be unique values or if there are outliers, that kind of thing. And then what the range and like distribution are, the spreads. Okay. Empty, bad, unique spread. And we're going to, uh, in a bit, when we do hands on, we're going to look at what checking for each of those things looks like in different tools and across different uh, data types. Data cleansing is a costly operation, right? It's very time intensive uh, to do it thoroughly, but not every field is equally important. When you're doing data cleansing, you're you know, often doing it as a necessity uh, of, I tried to work with this data and I was getting bogus information or, or errors or that kind of thing. You're usually forced to know it that way, fully cleaning. It's really time intensive. So you want to focus on the fields uh, or columns uh, that you're using, right? Or slim down to the subset of the data that you care about. Doing it comprehensively is a lot more work. That might be something you want to work towards, but suggest biting off a small chunk uh, to start. So the removal or replacement of values, usually that isn't the hard part. It's the discovery to figure out what needs those operations. It's spelunking through the data to, to see what's in there and you know, figuring out what needs to be weeded out or replaced. Okay, there's a number of uh, categories of data quality tools. So data quality is the umbrella thing here. We'll look at a profiling tool. There's tools around documenting your data. Data dictionaries are essentially a documentation tool. There's validation and testing, confirming that your data meets a certain specification. There's version control, ensuring that, okay, I've cleaned this data, what's changed since then? Version control of some sort allows you to do that. And then there's data cleaning tools for doing that replacement and that kind of thing. What do those tools actually boil down to? There's a bazillion of them, so I'm really not going to cover them all. Uh, they're changing all the time. There's a lot of commercial offerings, that kind of thing. I'm just going to focus on a handful of options that we have available to us as open source tools to demonstrate the different ways of approaching it. But there's a ton out there, you know, have hurt feelings if your favorite tools in in here. And the very first thing, which probably it's what you're doing already, even if you don't you know, realize it, is eyeballing. You're scrolling through the data and looking at what's in there and intuitively figuring out patterns from there. But you might also use your, you know, eyeballs through things like visualizations, right? Kind of plot this column uh, of values like over time or that kind of thing. And that tells me something about the na nature of my data and might show me where there's outliers and that kind of thing. That's very powerful. In your system of, of records, be it a database or a spreadsheet, right? You can use the different functions and things available there. We'll talk more about that in a second. Uh, you can use data analysis languages or programming tools. So things like Pandas, the package in Python, which we'll talk about a, uh, a little later, uh, or the R programming language for statistical computing. All those things allow you to you know, interact with data in a programmatic way. For validations, this is where things like constraints on your SQL columns come in, and we'll see what that looks like a little bit later. And then there's finally a, assertion frameworks like grid expectations, which allow you to define what the constraints of your data should be, regardless of where that data comes from. It's agnostic about where the data lives. It's decoupling the assertions, the things that you want to be true about your data from where that data lives, as opposed to having to modify like the type of a column in your database, for example, or depending on your skill set, the amount of time you want to invest, the size of your data set, that kind of thing. Some of these tools may be better or worse for your use case. Excel or other spreadsheet tools, so there's a lot you can actually do in there. I mean, I assume a lot of you are doing these things already, even if you didn't think of them as like data quality operations. So the biggest one is doing data validation, saying this entire column can only be one of this handful of numbers, right? That's a way of specifying categorical data constraints, where you might you know, put a restriction on it has to be greater than X and less than Y. All these things are data validation and allow you to do those kind of checks in a spreadsheet tool. There's other things like sorting and filtering to find outliers or dig into certain values. There's formulas like finding unique values or the minimum and maximum. And then again, the charting for showing how a distribution might, might look across a col one or multiple columns. Excel is great when you're working with data up to a certain size. The sort of hard limits are that Excel, I think, tops out at 5 million rows. That's a lot of rows for some people, but that's not a lot of rows for others. It's just going to depend on your use case of how far that can get you. But it does have some other limitations. For example, you're somewhat constrained by the 
expressiveness of the built-in formulas. And for things like the data validation, you're not going to be able to see an error unless you actually look at that cell. You have to scroll through the entire data set in order to see that, in fact, all of your uh, cells like meet the validation. So not great for large tables in that way either. I'm not going to spend any more time on spreadsheets today. I'll continue using the terminology, but because not everyone has access to it, it's a little less fun for the hands-on exercises. We're going to move on. Okay, what am I have you do here? Launch this environment in the background. So it takes a minute to spin up. Oh, me. Okay, we're going to go ahead and click this link. You should not have to log in or anything like that. Uh, thank you, Cindy. Just open in a tab and then you can you know, minimize it or put it off to the side. It'll take a minute or two to start. We'll look at what it should look like in a moment. And I'll give a walkthrough of what's going on there. In a second. Okay, with ensuring data quality, where, when, how might you want to do that? So if you think about processes like ETL pipeline, for those who aren't familiar, this is a sort of formal way of saying that usually you'll get your data from somewhere, you will do some operations, and then you'll put it somewhere else. Extract, transform, load, ETL. Some people have automated systems, some people or organizations have automated systems for doing this. Some people are, you know, actually copying and pasting and emailing and that kind of thing. But the concepts are the same. You can think of this as like before, during, or after your data operations. So in the before case, this is as data is coming in. If, for example, your data comes from a form on a web page that users are filling out, doing things like form field validation is going to help with your data quality because you could ensure an email address looks like an email address, that kind of thing. But similarly, constraints on the database are going to ensure that bad data can't go in. You know, we'll throw an error if you, you know, try and put a bit of text in for something that should be a dollar value, for example. During these transformations, you can do things like, you can do assertion. This is where things like the data validation in a uh, spreadsheet would come in um, or other tools that we'll look at uh, in a minute. And then after the process, you can do spot checks again, just scrolling through, scrolling through the data and, and similarly doing assertions after your formulas and whatever other trans transformations have been applied. This is, you know, dependent on your use case. And it also depends on how much you want to or can constrain or modify the source data. Are you only doing this data cleaning for your sort of analysis purposes, or do you want to you know, force these rules earlier on and therefore have the source data be more constrained. So avoiding bad data in the first place is usually preferable. It's less work after the fact. And therefore the sort of canonical source is, is more, could be more helpful to anyone who touches it. But you won't always have that level of control. Sometimes people are just handing you data. And also even while pushing those constraints upstream, it is nice. You unfortunately won't learn about all the constraints you should have had until later. She won't realize that someone's putting in text for a dollar value until they've already done it. Ideal is to push it forward, but reality is it's not always going to be possible. Okay. One time versus ongoing checks. In a similar idea from the before, during, after, this is, are you doing those checks as you're looking at it? Is it a thing that you have to actually be present for and have a spreadsheet open or have a tool that you execute, that kind of thing? Or is this happening on an ongoing basis? Is it automated in the background and those checks just performing on your behalf and let you know if there's a problem? A sort of parallel question is, are the validations or transformations you want to do, are they just needed for the purpose of this particular analysis? Or is this something that you want to stick, right, for yours and all future work with that data? Similarly, should the cleaning you're performing be applied to the source, source data and thus made permanent, right, affecting the source? Or is it just... You want to leave the source as is and transform the you know data as you're as you're bringing it to the place where you're working with it. Similarly, are you trying to reformat the data in a particular way? You might have two tables you need to bring into one. While doing that for the source data it might not be practical, but for your analysis purposes, you know, maybe that's a thing that you want, want to pull together. You wouldn't modify the source in this case, you'd do that as a transformation operation. And is that again a one-time thing? Is this analysis you're having to do on a regular basis? This is all going to go into, you know, how you're going to implement that transformation, that joining or filtering or whatever. You want to implement uh, data quality any time that data changes hands between people or systems. This is the ideal. I really like this quote from uh, Sam Bale, who's a uh, data person uh, that I've followed for a while. And I really like that idea of, okay, if, if the data is moving from one place to another, that's a good place to put in whatever checks you can. And something that's better than we just talked about this a minute ago. How much are you trying to just check that data is meeting a certain format and these kinds of things? 
versus how much are you forcing it to be a certain format, right? Like what hap- what should happen if data doesn't meet that constraint? Should it throw an error, kick it back to the user? You know, if like when you fill in a, a form and you type in, you know, password that doesn't meet the requirements, that is a, that is a hard constraint. It will not let you proceed unless you meet that. Or do you want to allow data to come in for, or any given piece of data to come in and more liberally and do these checks and the filtering and that kind of thing after the fact, depends on the use case. And also your definition of bad data is going to change over time. You're going to learn things about what you should have been restricting this kind of, whew, okay. That was a lot. I'm going to pause for a second and take questions. See a couple of people saying that they're getting timeouts. Try just following the link again. I'm going to hope that if a first don't succeed, refresh, try again. All right. So this is the fun part. This is where we actually get to do stuff. For those who uh, are not familiar, we're going to be using a tool called Jupyter Lab. Jupyter is a tool that can either run on your computer or in a cloud-based environment. We're using a sort of uh, temporary environment, right? Like you saw when you're looking at the page, it's building that environment out for you, but it's not saving that stuff like that. that that environment gets recycled after you don't use it for a little while. That's so really meant as like a place for things like this, just want demonstrations. The other, a couple of other sort of popular cloud-based ones are Google Colab and then locally Visual Studio Code. So those are two nice ones where you don't have to install anything special beside the Visual Studio Code, that desktop app, but it has this Jupyter environment built in. Jupyter is basically a code editor that has nice display of outputs. That's the simplest explanation I can think of. Think of it like a cross between code files, a Word doc, right? So it allows you to format and and present things and have, and like a spreadsheet where the data is there and you can interact with it and that kind of thing. It's like a mix between those things and it'll make more sense in a second one. Opening up Jupyter, let me bring that here. Okay. You have this editor interface, the sort of middle areas where you'll do the actual code editing. On the left-hand sidebar, which you'll see online in a second, there's a thing that looks like a folder and that's the file browser and that's what we're going to use to open up files. And then the sort of hamburger menu three line thing, I think what the icon is, that's like a table of contents. When we're looking at a notebook, which are like the files we're going to be working in, you can see the navigation there and, and jump around more. Those files that end with IPyNB, which is short for IPython notebook, are notebook files. And notebook files consist of cells. It's like building blocks of either text or code or these kinds of things, as well as for code, the output. We'll see what that looks like in just one second. But- uh, Aiden, I just want to cut in for a second. Please, Um, yeah. People are still saying they're having trouble loading and yeah. mine did timeout actually as well. Should we end up seeing what you have on your screen right now so we can just watch you go through it? Yeah, I will do just re- try refreshing. <laughs> <laughs> and if that doesn't work, I will show on my screen. Won't be as interactive, but you will be able to see what's happening. Okay. So when we have a notebook, which we'll start with this one, it's basically an interactive document. So you have these different cells that I mentioned. It starts text cell up here, and that's code cell here with output, more text, more code. These each run independently. You'll see a play button. Um, up at the sort of top bar here uh, that you can use to execute a cell. Whenever you go into a notebook for the first time, I recommend like running the entire thing. Notebooks, unlike source code files, they have they have state. I've opened this notebook. I've not run anything yet, but you see the output from the last time I did. In order to get these variables defined and that kind of thing, you have to rerun them. So what I usually recommend doing is just running the entire thing. And the easiest way to do that is the a uh, little like fast forward looking button. Here are the two arrows that say, when you hover over, it says restart the kernel, then rerun the whole notebook. The kernel is like where the code runs on the server. So it's the environment where the Python code in this case is actually running. Okay. Yeah. You can use these buttons to navigate around and press like con- those keyboard shortcuts for everything. And you could run like press control enter uh, to execute an individual cell. Okay. Go ahead. And if you got the the environment up, which looks like at least a few of you did. Go ahead and open pandas.ipynb, which you should see here. The file browser, so this is the folder icon on the left, double click pandas.ipynb, and then you should see that notebook opened in the main area here. And you're going to click the fast forward button to restart the kernel and run everything. That like clears the slate and re-executes this file. You'll see these like indicators on the left, this asterisk means it's currently running 
and it says that's busy down at the bottom here and then it just finished and executed them in order. So you see like the number one here means that cell executed first, I scroll down, this cell executed second, et cetera. What's going on here? We're using pandas, which is a data analysis tool to, to read in this data set, which is saved as a CSV in this folder. If you don't know anything about pandas, if you don't know anything about Python, that's totally fine. Just demonstrating a tool that you can use. We say we want to read the CSV file from the data folder, and then it's 311 from June 2019. The index is what's the primary key, what's the thing that we use to identify the rows. And for that, we use the unique key. Let me bring up the data set so you have a sense. This is like the official open data portal. And what you'll see is the unique key here as a column, which we specify we want to use the index. You have to tell pandas that certain columns are dates in order for it to treat them as such. We're going to do the created date and close date. And then we're only going to load a subset of the columns just for simplicity. I have those listed here and I pass in that list. All that is going in as options to the read CSV uh, method and then loading it as data frame, which we're storing as the variable DF. In these cells, they will output whatever the last line is. I just type DF at the bottom here. And when I executed it, it then output a truncated version of this table, which should look a lot like this one but with fewer columns and a different date range because we're using data. From so not knowing anything, else, even if you don't know anything else about the data, we can see that the unique key are identifiers and they look sequential-ish. Burrow, on the other hand, you know, that's probably everyone here knows, uh, at least the New Yorkers, there are five of them. And so that is categorical data, right? It's the borough should be one of these specific names. This is essentially a log of 311 requests which means each of them have timestamps and they're sequential, but it isn't a time series in the strict sense of, you know, there's not a fixed amount of time between every given entry. So there's no fixed intervals, but it is, you know, sequential by time uh, that they were created. Moving along here, we're looking at the column info. We'll just say data frame dot info. And this tells us about the different columns, uh, which it auto detected. We didn't have to tell it what the types were besides the dates. With the dates, I figured out those should be saved as date times and was able to parse those successfully. Object here just means just means strings or text, like agency and complaint type. Those are all just normal text things. Uh, zip code, it's parsing as a float. You might want to do that differently, but it's okay for now. Burrow is also a string, and then latitude and longitude are, are floats that are numeric. This uh, table also shows us uh, something useful here, which is the not null count. So or the not, these numbers are all different which means that the rows have different, the, they do have null values present, right? Yeah, there's 61,656 uh, entries in total. That is how many created dates there are. So that tells us that created date is present for every single row, but it looks like agency is also present for every row as is complaint type, but the other ones fall short. That means we have to deal with nulls. Maybe we exclude them. That's up to us, depending on what analysis. Here as an example, let's pull out some pull out the, the rows that do have nulls. Here we're saying for my data frame, look for, look at anything that is NA, which means like not present and look, look along any of the, like axis one means columns, I think, and look across all of them and then basically select that from the data frame. The syntax is a little funky, but this is essentially saying, look across all of the, the columns and any, for any rows that where any of the cells are, are nulls or other sort of nullish values, let's return that row. So we can see there's 4,960 rows that do have a null sum in the data we loaded. For example, here we can see that animal in a park complaint doesn't have a latitude and longitude. That's the case for a lot of these as well. This for hire vehicle complaint doesn't have a closed date. NAT is like not a time. Or maybe that means it was never closed. Maybe it means that the data was just missing. It might just um, depend. We, we don't know why that's the case. That doesn't really tell us that. Okay. What you do with these nulls is up to you, but this is just a way to, to pull them out uh, using pandas. Here we talked about for things like dates, maybe even though this isn't entries that are created in a fixed interval, right? It's whenever people call or submit, we would expect a sort of normal flow of calls to come in, right? Like a sort of steady-ish volume. A histogram looking over those rows by their created date is a nice way to see, okay, are we getting steady data, right? If there's something wrong with the system, it would show maybe too many records being created or too few. We are seeing, you know, some variance here from, from one day to another, that may be acceptable range that may not. We're only looking at seven days. We don't know if that's common or not, but 
Again, the histogram is just a nice, nice way to do that. I am seeing in the chat, Linda. Uh, yeah, so we're in that pandas.ipinb file, which uh, you should be able to get to from this folder and then double clicking uh, the pandas a file in the, in the browser there. And then you know, we're halfway down the file at this point. Okay, so scatter. So histograms are nice for seeing the distribution of a single value. This is like how many of each created date fall under each day. Scatter plots are a nice way to see kind of distribution of two values uh, against each other. Latitude and longitude, for example, that would give us what is essentially a map. Yeah. So you might, if, if there's two values that you expect to somewhat corresponding, a scatter plot is a nice way to see if they're outliers or clusters, that kind of thing, or if they follow some trend. But just a quick example of like how you might use chart to you know, see what data needs to be cleaned. That's great, but it's a little bit manual, right? We're having to check every single column for nulls, check like a histogram for, for certain columns, or it's a little bit tedious. Thankfully, there are tools that are nice for doing a bunch of this stuff for us in a sort of systematic way. And I'll show you what I mean. If you double click on the profiling.ipinb file, you'll see this and it probably doesn't show anything. You might have to rerun it. Again, click that double arrow uh, to restart the kernel and run all cells. What we should see after a second, here it's loading just like we did in the last in the last notebook, and then using this pandas profiling tool to inspect that data frame. Here we're not telling it what to look for really. We're just saying generated profile report and display it here. And what it's going to do is look across all of everything in our data frame, everything in our table, and just tell us some stuff about it, which may or may not be useful for uh, cleaning any single one of the things. First of all, it's saying just general information. Well, there's several different variables, meaning columns. There are 45,000 different different rows. 3,600 of them are have missing cells. This is a different month than we were looking at in the past uh, notebook, by the way, in case that was confusing. 1% of the cells are empty. So that's maybe more than we expected. That's the same. Just depends on what the data set is, et cetera. If you click over into this variables tab, it goes through and creates like information area for every single one of the columns. For example, in unique key, it determined that this value is unique. There's hundred percent distinct values in here. There are no duplicates. Also none are myth missing. There are no zeros, no negative numbers, et cetera. For agency, it determined that they are uh, categorical, right? So it's actually seeing 16 distinct agencies in here, and it shows the counts for each of those. So it's essentially generating the histogram for you. You can also toggle details here. Um, and yeah, it shows you a longer list of those common values. Uh, let's look at something with some nulls. Latitude, we saw some missing values in that when we, when we pulled it out. And here it's saying that 582 of the rows are missing latitude. So that's 1.3%. Uh, of the rows. It's also skewed. That's interesting. That means most of the values tend to be clustered around a certain area, but then there's outliers. We can see that in our minimum and maximum here that you know, the maximum is uh, a latitude of uh, 40.9, which is what you'd expect as the, the sort of geographic location of New York City. But then the minimum is this number that's very close to zero. And that is not what we would expect because I'm pretty sure that's in the middle of the Atlantic. Yeah, it requires some cleaning up. We'll come back to that. But anyway, the profiler is not particularly smart, but it will tell you things that you should then dig into further. It's, it's performing a bunch of those checks, which I listed earlier of the, you know, the empty bad unique spread, right? It's giving you hints about what those might be. Different profiling tools are going to have more sophistication. Maybe you'll run it once and then do some customization or clean up and that kind of thing, run it again, just to show you the power of, of a profiling tool. And this one happens to work integrated with pandas and Jupyter notebooks. Keeping an eye on time here. Next is unit testing. Unit tests for those uh, who aren't familiar are basically a way to ensure chunks of code are working as expected. So in this very simple example, right? We have an add function, we pass in two numbers, and then we assert that the, the value that comes out, the total, is what we expect. Assert the total is three when we add one and two. This is a, a trivial example of a unit test, but you can assert whatever you want. On a more basic level, yeah, you're running some code and you're checking the values. You add. This example is Python. We're going to look at uh, Python in a second as a more like slightly more real world thing, but you can do this in any language, any coding language with a testing framework. And unit testing generally works with fake data. But they don't have to. They can run against real. You just want to be mindful 
that when you are doing data testing, you work on a copy of your data or working with read-only permissions, you don't accidentally delete it or that kind of thing. But we can use these tests to run against real data and, and perform assertions, similar to the way that we would use unit tests as software developers to check the functionality of your code. You're just checking outputs, right? It's the same principle. If you're just doing one-time checks, like for a one-time analysis, doing automated testing like this is probably not worth it. But if you have ongoing checks or a, a, val a analysis that you perform at a certain, with a certain regularity, it might be something you want to look into. Let's now hop over to the test underscore data dot pi file. And then you also want to do file. Well, actually you can just watch, you can just watch this one, but this is a test file. There's a little bit of setup where it's importing the packages, the basically plugins that it needs. And then it's loading the data again, very similarly to what we we're doing before. And so we can do some pretty simple checks, things like check the data frame, the number of columns, pull out all the columns and then ask for the length of that, assert that there are 41 columns, right? Not that interesting. If one of those columns is missing, you'd probably want to know about it. This just ensures that uh, you're, you're getting uh, the structure that you would expect. Similarly, while we saw that there are outliers, we would expect the median latitude to be around the center of New York City. It should be around 40.73061, give or take one thousandth of a um, degree, right? Similar to longitude. Again, to not super sophisticated checks, but you can write whatever code you need in order to like make them more sophisticated and you can tighten up, up over time as your like data cleaning gets better and better. Next, we'll, we'll hop back to the pandas notebook and here you will actually interact with it yourself. We're looking at categorical data. Complaint type is one of those that has core categorical data where text get in, gets input, but theoretically it should be one of a sort of set of values. We're displaying the full list of value counts here. And so value counts are how many times does each unique value appear? There are some that appear a bunch like noise residential and request large bulk item collection. Those are things that appear a bunch of times as through on requests. But if we scroll all the way down to the bottom, we see a bunch of one-offs and those one-offs look not, this is out from 2019, but it looks like a bunch of junk was being put into there. And it actually looks like someone's trying to hack the system because people are like putting things that look like code. That's interesting, but probably not very useful for our now. We want to get those out somehow. So we could go through and, and find those individual values and delete them or replace them and that kind of thing, but that'd be tedious. Let's instead just say, we want to get rid of any one-offs. So here I'm going to select uh, from that list of you know unique values and counts. I'm going to say, give me all of those where the count is equal to one, pull out those complaint types, print those out. It should just be a list of the complaint types from above that only appear once. And there are things that look real, but for the purposes of this, this analysis, let's say we're okay getting rid of those too. Let's keep everything that is in a one-off. We're going to say, check our complaint types for things in that one-off list, and then select from the data frame anything that is not, uh, this, this tilde uh, symbol means not, anything that is not a one-off request. Again, I, you are not expected to know anything about pandas. This is just showing that in a few lines of code, we're able to do this thing that would be like part of a spreadsheet or, or, or tedious or a, long, a large set of data doing it by hand. Here we can you know, do it with a few lines of code. We now have a cleaned up data set that has 61,000 uh, rows left. That is just a, a small bit of like non-trivial data cleaning. Watching time here, I think, you know, we'll have just a minute to do, to do a little bit of hands-on SQL. So a lot of you probably if not directly are dealing with data that is coming from a SQL database, the notable ones being MySQL, PostgreSQL, Microsoft SQL, Oracle. If you heard these names, they're all SQL databases. Go ahead and run this. Again, the double arrows there, we just start and run. So I have the data loaded in the hidden cells up there. Don't need to worry about that. And here we're just going to describe the request table. Backslash D is when you're using Postgres, this particular database, that's how you ask for what the structure is. We have this key column, create a date, et cetera. Uh, and that tells us about the types. So just like in pandas, when we saw value counts of give me the unique, uh, the counts of each unique value here, we are doing the same thing with SQL. So not important what the SQL is, but just the, p the point being that you can do equivalent operations, you know, across different tools with, with SQL though, 
because it is meant as a data store, it does allow you to do validations in a way that are called constraints. And that's something you actually tell the database to enforce. But there's somewhat limited and express of this, and you need to be able to modify your database in order to implement them. But they're very powerful because they prevent bad data from getting in. Here, I am taking that table and I'm altering it. And I'm saying, okay, the request's uh, unique key should be its primary key. That is the identifier that we're using. And that will enforce uniqueness and make it quick to look up by that value. Um, here, when dealing with different data types, we can see the created date that was up here as a text field. Maybe we want it represented as an actual date so we can do things like query by year or day of the week or operations like that. Here, we're actually going to modify the structure and saying, okay, that created date should, first of all, should not be null. And second of all, we should convert it to a timestamp and it's in this format. It's you know, two digit month, two digit day, four digit year, et cetera. That's how it's converting from that text into an actual timestamp type. Again, the syntax, they're like what it's actually doing here isn't important, but the important thing is like you express in the SQL syntax how to define like types like timestamp and do conversions. Similarly, down here, let's say we wanted to make sure that the latitude is between 40 and 41. That's where New York falls. Latitude's this way. New York falls this way. When I try and put that constraint on it, it says, I'm sorry, that check constraint is violated by some row. We can't actually enforce that it's greater than 40 and less than 41 because there's bad data in there. Here, we're going to select out and find out like what those minimum and maximum values are. We see that same low number that appeared in the profiling page. And here we want to nullify, we want to empty out those values. If that latitude is the absolute value, it's less than one, to convert it to null. Once we do that, we can then put the, if we run this constraint again, it should complete because the data now conforms to this requirement that we're giving it. It says, yep, yeah, okay, no problem. From here on out, like all data will meet this constraint. I was hoping to have time for you to actually uh, do the exercise. That's going to have to be a take home. I apologize. Squeezed in way too much. If you, you can use that same link and it should work. You can actually download from that interface if you want to like keep your own copy. Data cleaning is really about finding unexpected values. And a great way to find what's unexpected is to explicitly define what is expected. Start with whatever works, with whatever works. Use whatever tools you have at your disposal and don't stress too much about getting access to something because any data quality and assurances you're putting in there are better than nothing. Also, size matters. If you're dealing with 100 rows versus 100 million rows, your you know sort of level of effort for doing exploration and cleaning and, and efficiency and that kind of thing are can be very different. Remember the mnemonic, uh, empty, bad, unique spread. And I have another session on Friday where we'll get further into pandas and hopefully have time to actually, you actually get to write a bit of code. I have some links for some other things to check. Again, I will email out these slides, so don't worry about grabbing those links right now. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, we're at the top of the hour, but I am happy to hang on for anyone who cares. To thank. You. Otherwise, uh, thank you so much for joining. Thank you, Aiden. There's some great feedback in the chat. Everybody's saying, thank you. This was great. I did capture a couple of questions. The first one is the profiling tool, something unique to Jupyter Notebooks, or can we do that in a Python 3 environment as well? You can, it can run from the command line and you could, there's an option to like output an HTML file. It'll just write a HTML file and then you can like open that in a browser. Okay. How do you handle missing cells? I think you answered this with the assertions that you were setting, but if you could quickly just give a little bit of an answer to that question. Yeah. There's no right answer. That's up to you, right? If you're trying to do a map of, you know, where all these complaints occur by their latitude and longitude and something doesn't have a latitude and longitude, I guess you're going to exclude it. Or if there's the address, but not the latitude and longitude, maybe you geocode it, backfill those values. So it, it just depends like what's the yeah like how much effort are you willing to put in how complete does this need to be like how thorough do you need to be or is it okay to exclude some individual rows that kind of thing Great. and the last question i have someone's asking for tips on working with large data yeah again large is relative right if you're facebook you have different large data concerns than if you're aiden feldman dealing with his expenses if you're in a if you're in a 
organization that works that has large data, you're probably going to have systems to work with it, I would think. So whether that's database clusters or analytics environments like Redshift or that kind of thing, again, like use what tools are available to you. Yeah, you can certainly find tools that deal with when you're working with large data, you, you usually want to do things in parallel, right? To not have to operate in every single row sequentially. Tools that uh, allow you to do that, like Spark and Hadoop and, and these kinds of things. But again, like big is relative, like a SQL database can get you really far. Okay, great. I think we'll take one more question here. From your experience, do you have to care about constraints of tools or languages? For example, what you were showing was Python, where you can make certain kinds of statements and types of objects slash loops you can use versus SQL, where you have to be more declarative and have more constraints. Yeah, good question. Yeah, of course you have to care, right? Or in some cases you need to care, and in some cases you don't. For example, Pandas works entirely in memory. You have to have enough memory on your machine in order to load all the data that you want to operate on. You can operate on a sample, and if that's okay for your use case, then that's fine. But working in a programming language, you can be much more expressive and create functions and you know variables that have the names you want to and this kind of thing. Whereas, like this person said, SQL, you have to do that more declarative, but it's going to operate on probably what's the source data or closer to the source data and can do sort of enforcement in real time of those constraints and that kind of thing. Use what you're comfortable with, use what's available to you. Doing things like constraints in SQL are great because then you can stop the problem before it happens. But for after the fact analysis in Comfortable Panda, I use that, but it's really just like what you're comfortable with, what you have access to if your data will fit in memory, like these kinds of things. Thank you so much. Um, uh, 